Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, I'm going to be talking about the good, the bad and the ugly of coordinated disclosure and I'll get into a bit of that later on. So, first up, doxing myself. Who am I? I am not a big fan of these slides. Um, what we'll say is I've had a really good year and if you're interested in anything that I've done and sort of more about my background, you can head over to my blog and you can always hit me up on Twitter with any questions or anything at all. Um, what I'd like to speak about today is more about the background and the stuff that people don't hear me talking about because I can't most of the time. Um, so it's more of the circumstances around disclosure and my personal experiences. And if you can take something from that, that'd be brilliant. So disclaimer, the back of my head at the moment, I'm thinking this is a really terrible fucking idea. But at the same time, you know, I'm not a lawyer or a vulnerability disclosure expert. Please take anything you feel when you see today and, you know, make some good use of it. Uh, a lot of you here will be students and you'll be learning some bits and pieces that I didn't when I first got into it. Please don't go out and hack systems that you have no authorised reason to do so. And, you know, don't use any of the stuff that I have here today with regards to justification for doing it. So first up, a history lesson. This is Alfred Charles Hobbs. I would call him a bit of an old school hacker. Now what he did back in 1853 was pick locks. And what he would do, he would go around finding the best locks of that day and time. And he would set himself challenges in breaking those locks. And he would. He'd actually get into them and, you know, he'd cause a bit of fuss whilst doing it. Now, at the great exhibition in Crystal Palace in 1853, he was set a challenge to break one of the locks. It was a Brahms lock. And the manufacturers gave him a set of blank keys and a lock and said, you have 30 days in which to break this lock. Now, Alfred here is pretty good at what he does, and he managed to do it in 24 days. Of course, there was a big fanfare about it. But what did the manufacturers do? They took it negatively. And they actually turned around and said, well, the lock was broken. There was something wrong with it. They didn't believe for a minute that they were at fault. Now, this caused a lot of controversy. And Alfred wasn't shy of controversy at all. He then went on to publish a paper that detailed <clears throat> all the different problems with the locks of those days the vulnerabilities, and also detailed about safes. He felt, in his mind, that people needed to know about it. And you can see here, rogues are very keen in their profession and know already much more than we can teach them. So he's basically saying the bad guys know this stuff. So what we should do is let the public know about it so they can best protect themselves. So how do you let people know about the problems. Now, there are a couple of different ways of disclosure. First one is non-disclosure. And this can be a case of where you're working for a company and they've been told to do some research or a security test on a vendor, or like a product or something like that. And you'll sign a contract and it'll be, you cannot talk about those problems. Also, in addition to this, you have people, researchers, who will find out about problems and they will keep it to themselves. You'll have government organisations find out about these problems and they will stockpile them for their own good. You also have people who will possibly get into a NDA with a zero-day organisation who buy these vulnerabilities. But basically, the point is, you keep your mouth shut. Which brings us on to our next one, coordinated disclosure. So when I started doing my slides and I was talking to people on Twitter, one of the guys uh, that I was talking with, he said, well, actually, I called it responsible disclosure. And he said, well, actually, some of the people want to call it coordinated. And he explained why. And some of the reasons were is that responsible disclosure might send the wrong signal. 
Um, some people prefer it, but coordinated um, was something that Microsoft kind of pushed for when one of their own actually published a report some years back on the whole subject of full disclosure. So now industries adopted coordinated, which shows pretty much that everyone's working all together on something. So the purpose of this is when you'll find something, you'll report it to the vendor, and you'll go through a process. It's a two-way thing. And there could be other parties involved. You could have bug bounty programs or maybe some external agency like the FBI. Now, there are some problems with coordinated disclosure. We have a pretty much a waiting game. Us as researchers have to disclose our vulnerabilities and then we wait. Now, Google Zero, they have theirs as 90 days, and then they'll release. But as you can see from here, that timeline can extend. So, you know, it could be anything up to eight, eight months there. Some of mine are nine months, nearly enough a year. And that shows, in a sense, that you have to have some level of patience. But if you don't want to have patience and you just want to get out there, here comes full disclosure. <laughs> so what happens in full disclosure? It is a case of, yeah, dropping it like it's hot. You will see this where guys will go onto Twitter, they'll have blog posts, and they'll release. And it's released for the most public exposure possible. Now, their motives may be one of their own exposure for credibility within the industry, for their own ego, or it could be because they actually want to let the public know about this to better protect themselves, going back to Alfred's point. But this can get you into some bother and a lot of trouble. Understandably, vendors don't always like it when you go full disclosure on them. And this isn't something that's new. So here's Peter Zaco. A.K.A. Lodge, uh, Mudge from the Loft, and he's actually part of the um, Loft Hacker Collective and the Cult of the Dead Cow. I'm just going to play this video. Let's get it up. Go back. Long run out on any such such crimes. As a group, the Cult of the Dead Cow gained worldwide attention for releasing hacking tools that let users take control of Windows software, forcing Microsoft to confront security problems with its programs. Uh, I've released several security advisories on various pieces of commercial software, which have uh, prompted vendor patches, which means they improved the software after we pointed it out to them. Uh, unfortunately, many times... They would not improve the software until we actually went public with the findings. Uh, companies do indeed want to ignore problems as long as possible. Uh, it's cheaper for them. Later. Oops, sorry, my bad. Let's go back a slide. That way. No. Fucking Google. <laughs> I'm a newbie with this stuff. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, is it on full screen? No, it's not, is it? It was. Okay. Let's go back then. Um, right. I'll just leave it like that for the moment. Um, so basically, what we have there, we have... Him saying, 20 years ago, mind you, that the only way he could get things to change was to go full disclosure. And as you, if you were at the beer farmer's talk earlier on, you would have seen some incidents where people have come out about issues. And we're still having it this day and age. You know, um, researchers are either getting frustrated or feel the need to go full disclosure in public. And the problem is as well, we have laws that are being used from the, the 80s and they don't give us any kind of protection either. So what will happen is we will then end up in a lot of shit, to be fair. And part of this problem is sometimes it's really hard to navigate. Not only do we have the laws to think about, 
we have standards. And then the vendors will implement their own terms of service. You look at a product, and Katie has even um, helped the bug bounty community really, really like a lot. And there are now bug bounty programs that help researchers who, who want to explore and have a look at things. But Amit, uh, she had a look into things as she saw the terms of service in one of the vendor's products forbidded someone from being able to investigate. Now, that's within a bug bounty program. That's somewhere we're supposed to be allowed to have a play, but yet the terms of service contradict it. So what we need ourselves, we need a lot more safe harbors, places where we're free to research and have a look. We need a clearer understanding of the terms of service, all the end user license agreements, the laws, and we need some guidance for it. And here I've got Amit Elazari. I've also got uh, Miss Chief Hu Saskia, and she's in the UK, and she's been looking at set standards and laws, and she's really good at, at kind of like putting big red circles around wording and you know pointing it out, and she's helping us in that regard. And also um, Katie at the end there. So what do we do? We have this thin line that we could cross at any time. We have laws that say to us, oh, you can or you can't, and this is how you go about it, and th there is not much guidance at all. But then we also have this issue where we've been going through something with a vendor, and we may face problems. They may dr drive us crazy. Um, we may get very frustrated, and it then boils down to a moral compass of that person. I've, I know friends who are really good researchers and stuff, and they've had to drop stuff and, you know, make it public, and, or they've had to sell, I mean, I know guys have turned around to me and said, yeah, security researchers do really well, you know, they do talks and everything else, but I've never known one person not to do badly by se selling zero days. You know, if it's less problems, why wouldn't you? But then it's moral guidance, and I love this word, anonymy. It's a condition in which society provides little moral guidance to individuals. And I think we have some of that within our industry. And we need guidance from our peers and our, uh, the people above us to help us know what to do in certain circumstances. Now, if you don't want any of those problems, sometimes you head over to the bug bounty programs and it's very good. You can go in and, enter and work with a vendor and they'll have a triage process and everything will go quite well. And then you may get a payout, but then you may also get a dupe or it'd be classed as something like an information, it's not relevant, you, you get nothing. So you've spent maybe you know nights or weeks even on something for nothing. But some people only want recognition and that's fine, and some people want payouts and the financial problems, the, the finance with it. But I think the bug bounty programs themselves have actually led to possibly an expect expectation of, ex of like having money, and that can lead to extortion. Now, one of the problems that we've had come up, um, it's quite an interesting case, was Uber. Uber had a bug bounty program, and their payout was 10,000. Now, that's fantastic. You find a problem with Uber, you get 10 grand. These kids found a problem with Uber. They then proceeded to download 50 million users' details. They then approached Uber and said, 10K, I don't think so. I want more. <laughs> and they got away with it. Uber caved in. And not only did Uber cave in, they also got into other like legal problems because they hid the fact that it happened. Um, but they actually caved in. So these guys thought, you know, it's brilliant. I'm now going to go ahead and do it to someone else. So that's what, exactly what they did. And then they got arrested for extortion. <laughs> so, you know, but the president was set. They thought they could get away with it and do it. What we have today is standards. So we have the ISO 29147 and the ISO 30, now, these are made by the International Organization for Standardization, and our group that's responsible for the UK matters is the BSI. So there are two standards. As you can see, they're really expensive. And if you're a student or you have access to them some way, download them and read them now.
because they are pricey documents and they are really valid, valuable documents to actually look at and read. So you can actually get the 2014 version for free. Uh, Katie made sure that people could get hold of this. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the 2018 version came. Um, I've got all three versions. I compared the 2014 version to the 2018 with a different tool and there was extensive changes. Um, not just the page count, but you had the scope that was different, the terminology that was different, uh, mention of stakeholders. Reading through it, it's a brilliant document, but reading through it, it didn't feel like it was written for us. It feels like it was written for the vendors and the companies. And fair enough, they're ISO standards. That's who they should be written for. But at the same time, what do we have? But if you're going to get into bug bounty programs or you're going to get into vulnerability disclosure, please go and read these because it will help. So the um, one on uh, the ISO 29147 on this side, um, that's how vendors would deal with a external vulnerability um, disclosure to them. And the uh, 30111 works with that in a sense and it, it deals with the internal processes. And I've had to watch talks and I've had to read different papers and around that to t kind of understand what these documents do. Um, because half the time when you read in terms of service and legal stuff and ISO standards, if you're not from, like, you just don't understand it. You, you can read it. However, there are some really good people, like I said before, you have Katie and you have Amit, and they're actually lowering the entry of being able to understand this stuff with some of the talks that they've done. Um, that's one of the diagrams from one of the standards. That diagram appears in both standards and it shows the flow of what happens in, in circumstances of whether it's external or whether it comes in internally. And it shows them how to deal with it. Because some of the times we will report a vulnerability to a company and they won't have a vulnerability management program at all. In fact, they won't even know what to do with it at all. Um, I've had that a lot. <clears throat> so yeah, please check out their talks. They're really good and these girls brilliant at it. So <clears throat> spot the difference. This is the CERT guide. Very similar document. It's not an ISO standard, it's a guide, more of a report. But it shows the flow from the finder, who would be us security researchers, and then you've also got the finder on the ISO standard also. So there are some differences between them. That one there looks more complex, but there's also something that's the same. Can anyone tell me what might be the same? No? The, the what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beer for Randy. <laughs> um, if you have a look, if you have a look at the finder, you'll see that the arrows are one way. The communication doesn't never go back to the finder. So we have vendors who are actually reading these documents, looking at the diagrams to make sense of this stuff, and they're getting the wrong visual, rep like the wrong visual cues. It, yeah, exactly. It doesn't make sense. And Saskia originally brought this up in her talk, and I looked at it, and I thought, right, okay. It, she's right, 100%. And I had a look at CERT, and they were the same. However, CERT are very receptive of amendments and changes. Now, Alan reached out to me on Twitter when he knew I was doing my talk. And I'll tell you one thing now. Being able to speak to someone who's actually an author of one of these documents firsthand, when I know the, the loopholes that you have to jump through to even get any changes or speak to people with regards to the ISO standards, I, I find out the ISO standards people the other day and they said, right, you need to speak to the BSI. I find out the BSI. They said, right, you need to write us an email and we'll forward it through to the right people because it's the people who are like Cisco, Microsoft, all these big companies who are dealing with it. So you don't get that one-to-one -one communication as a researcher be like, I've got an idea. Will you do something? These guys spoke to me on Twitter. I told him. I said, can you look at the arrows? And he's like, sure, yeah. All the arrows are pointing away from the finder. Nothing goes back. He's like, sure, no problem. Next revision, going to get changed. So small wins, right? 
It's also very readable. It's realistic. And it feels like it's been actually written for our security researchers. For the first time, I've read something and I've been like, oh, I totally agree with this. And it, less, it does feel less bureaucratic overall. I sat down with a bunch of guys um, online and we had a look. And they're a mixture of hats. And for the first time, I had a bunch of hackers talking about law and legalization and standards. And they loved it. You know, um, they said, yeah, 100%. They, they agree with the stuff that was in there. And they were really happy that standards and stuff are moving forwards to help them. So please go and download it. It's free. So you don't have to pay for it at all. 121 pages. And it? it's a really good read. Really good read. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I need a drink of water before I start this part. <clears throat> I need a whiskey as well. So as you know, this talk is about the good, the bad and the ugly. And because I wanted to end up on a high, I started with the ugly first. I didn't want to depress anyone. So we're going to start with the ugly. And the first one up is whois.com. So it's my first ever bug. Yay, go me. I had no idea what I was doing at all. And I found it pretty much by accident. Um, I was sat online one night, I had my VPN on, I was doing some OSINT work, and I had a check, I was checking out some details basically. Um, I put a website into Who Is, and for some reason, all the details were showing. And I knew that to be true with some American sites and stuff like that. But post GDPR, you shouldn't be able to put a UK site in and get details, right? That's not right at all. So I was like, OK, I'm stupid. I've done something wrong. So I went and I did another domain name. And that one, all the details were redacted. I was like, well, well, hang on a minute. I went back to the other one, and the details were redacted. Was I seeing things? No. I checked through the code, and I could see what they were doing. So basically, what they were doing was, when you did a request, they were actually sending through and pulling another page called request PHP. Now, that, this request PHP page would then update the, the website page with all the details. And since GDPR, what it's been doing is refreshing the database, so then it just shows all as redacted. But because I was on a shitty VPN and the connection was so slow, by the time it got to me, it hasn't got through. So I was like, okay, I found something possibly. And um, it dawned on me, holy shit, like this is post GDPR. We've got all these people's details. I know they were there previously, but afterwards, this is kind of like a bit of a breach. Um, so I sat down and I wrote some code that would go through whois.com and their entire database and grab all of the domain names and all of the details as well. Just as a proof of concept, not for nothing nefarious at all. And I issued um, an email to them. I tried to get hold of the right people. I was having no luck. I spoke to one of the chat agents and he wanted me to give everything to him over the like the plane. And I'm like, no, not happening. Can you put me through to someone? I literally, it was, it was, it was a bit of a ball lake to be fair. So what did I do? Newbie, starting out, I went through to a disclosure assistance program. And it, it was an experience in itself. Um, bearing in mind, I started this in July 2018, and I'm still emailing people now. I'm going to show you the actual a video of it happening. Let's see. So as you can see here, I'm pulling the details. You've got the name, address, um, postcode. All the registration dates. I did it once, twice, three times for luck, just to prove that I could do it. And I was saving these details to a um, little file. 
And as you can see, I've actually called it Domain Protect because what I was trying to do then was figure out a way of how I could protect these details. If whois.com were letting anyone be able to do this, and I surely wasn't probably the only person doing this, how could I figure out a way to code in a protection mechanism so it would pull the details? So what happens now is I go to the same domain. Do my search. <laughs> yeah, I've got shitty internet, right? <laughs> and see, it's showing the details. But what you'll see up in the top corner, it says updated 340 days ago. And that's a little indicator to just tell me that I was actually having a successful find. So if we oh, go back, just to show you, and I'll try and bring that up. If you look again, on the top hand corner, you'll see a little round disk thing. It's got updated 340 days ago. And that's how I knew that it was actually working well. Because that was all part and parcel tied into the script, uh, the their refresh PHP. So there we go again. I've pulled it again. Oh, so what did I do? My bad. So yeah, the registrant contact details are there. Run my script. Pulls the details again. I go back to the site. I let it run through. And then all the details disappear because it's been updated. I run my code. And it can't pull any details. Awesome. So, whois.com. If I was whois and I had someone telling me about that, I'd be really interested. Um, no, possibly breach. But it's been a matter of delayed responses. It's been broken down to like nine months. So, I'll break it down. The first three months, I was waiting on anything to actually get done and for the right people to be informed. So then that was July time. So by September 6, Hacker One got in touch with them, disclosed a report. They have a system where they send them an email and they'll um, let them know about everything happening. They'll have a link to click on. Um, and I didn't know any of this stuff was going on in the background. Um, completely unaware. Because what actually happened with my ticket was my ticket got put into a category where it's non-responsive vendors. So I was like literally sending loads of messages, loads of messages to HackerOne, to anyone like who would listen. And it was like screaming into the fucking void because no one was getting back to me. Because when you're in that category, they don't get notifications, which is wrong. Finally, I bumped into one of the guys at a conference and I asked him about it and he gave me his telephone number and I spoke to him and he was really helpful, really helpful. And then from there it got changed and then it was back into the right category again. Which then we proceeded to look at the emails and the communication between HackerOne and Whois. So Whois sent an email that claimed it was not an issue. They literally wrote an email where they detailed the problem extensively and said, oh, it's not an issue. Um, but what actually happened was they got told six, September the 6th and then between September the 7th and September the 10th, the code got changed anyway. How do I know this? Because of the Wayback Machine. It's a brilliant thing. And then I was trying to, during my process of trying to find out what was going on, and I was getting no reply back from HackerOne. I was reaching out to who is too. And there was a complete communication shutdown. They just would not talk to me. They said, no, go and speak to HackerOne. We've, we've spoken to them. And I've reached out as well and told them about doing a talk today and no response. I mean, as you can see, and it's very, very 
light, you can read it. Hello, Christina. Yes, they reached out to us regarding the supposed vulnerability. Sorry, I've got a, like a video of it working <laughs> quite well. Um, and we have responded to their email with the explanation that it wasn't the case. You may reach out to HackerOne to obtain information about our response to their email. The case has now been closed. So for that, it got fixed and end of case. Yeah, but what could I have done in that circumstance? I could have found that and I could have just dropped it on Twitter. Then every single fucking hacker would have gone out and scraped all the details of anyone that they could. And I know there are companies that have already got these database details, but I didn't because my moral compass at that time was telling me to do the right thing. No comment. <laughs> 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 so basically it really is it's unacceptable and what I've done um, I'm pursuing it um, I know there's very little that HackerOne can do I know there's communication shutdown with who is and I don't know if I'm going to get any shit for saying about it but basically I did do all the right things um, but what I did do is I wrote a two page report to HackerOne just detailing all the timeline and any questions that I had about it and then room for improvement because obviously I want other researchers to do well. If they don't have anywhere to go, the Disclosure Assistance Programme is there to help them and I, I want them to have the best experience. I don't want anyone being nine months down the line and still like having issues. So yeah, so I've written a report to hopefully that will help. Okay, the bad. It gets better. <laughs> Microsoft Office 365. Here's Gary. Gary is a sys admin and he's adopted Office 365 to improve productivity in the workplace. In fact, he's got half of his users now using mobile phones and they're sharing documents and it's really good. And here's Kevin. Kevin's a happy hacker. He has cool stickers but very bad intentions. And he's been trying for months to get into Gary's network and to get to his users, but because Gary is a really good admin, he's got two-factor authentication on his user accounts. So he can't get in. Yeah. So, going to give you a crash course on Microsoft Office 365 subscriptions, just in case you don't know about them. So we have different types of accounts. We have admin accounts, normally global admin accounts, and then they vary between like billing administrator and these kind of things. But essentially you have the keys to the kingdom if you have one of these. Then you have a subscribed user account. Now these subscribed user accounts, they normally come in with different packages. So <clears throat> I know it's not very good and you can't really see it that well, but you have either uh, a monthly subscription base, and that's the way that Office 365 is, is pretty much moved towards, or you can have like a one-off for home users, and it's a one-off fee. But the differences between them is the stuff that you can access. So if we have a look here, this Office 365 is the uh, business one. £7.90 a month, and you get your Outlook, uh, you can get Excel, Word, OneDrive, but you don't get SharePoint. So what you'd need to do, you'd have to buy it as an extra bolt on, which would cost like £3.80 per month. Um, then you also have the other packages up the way, which also include SharePoint. Um, these ones, this one here doesn't, but the rest of them do. So these users can only access the products that they're paying for, and then anything else that they want, basically, they just have to upgrade their subscription. Everyone understand that? Cool. Right. So we have the online versions of Office, uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, SharePoint, etc. And Microsoft has a really good business model. In fact, they've got 155 million active users with a gro growth of 3 million per month. That's a lot of money, you know, even if you've got the very basic account. So to get a like a raise of hands, right? So say if you're a admin, um, do you think you'll be able to access everything, all these different products, packages? Anyone? Do you think you would? Yep, yep. How about a subscribe user who's got a um, 
let's make it more precise. So say if we've got SharePoint and we've got the, the business one that we had there. Shows as no SharePoint. Do you think they could get SharePoint if they wanted? <laughs> if they tried. <laughs> What happens here, and, and is part of the problem, is that Microsoft have made it a free-for-all. Shock. <laughs> Not only can the admin account get into SharePoint, standard. If you're a subscribed user, you can get into SharePoint, standard. If you have a shared mailbox account, you can also access SharePoint. If you have an unlicensed account, you can access SharePoint. And how do I know this? Because I like fucking around on my computer, just pretending to be a user and seeing what I can get away with. And that's how I found it. Just going through a normal process of just testing things and seeing what works and what doesn't. It's not a groundbreaking discovery, nor is it a zero day, but it's bad. And it's putting people at risk. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> So back to Gary and Kevin. So what is the problem here? Shared mailboxes can access SharePoint and so can unlicensed. So Gary's a really good admin, as we said. He's got two-factor authentication on all of his user accounts. But Gary doesn't know you need to put two-factor authentication on a shared mailbox user. Because why would you? Generally speaking, they don't have passwords. But what's actually happened recently is that Microsoft has allowed people to be able to assign a password to a shared mailbox. And this is because they can then get on their phone. Because when it comes to mobile phone support with um, Outlook, Microsoft is a little bit lacking on anything that's the shared mailbox room. So now that shared mailbox has a password. But it doesn't have two-factor authentication. Kevin can now get into the accounts. Also, with an unlicensed, exactly the same situation. Now, an unlicensed subscription would probably be someone who's left the company, and what they've done is they've handed in their phone, so there'd be no two-factor authentication, really. If, and to be fair, I don't think everyone out there does put two-factor authentication on their Microsoft Office 365 accounts. I mean, the average score is something like 39 if you go by the secure score um, on the tenants, and that can be improved by, by adding stuff like that. What's worse is with the, share the shared mailbox accounts, the monitoring is turned off by default within the audit logs. You have to specifically do a PowerShell command for it then to be showing up. How do I know this? Because I found it and then I had to do this because I was like, where's all the details of who's been logging in and everything else with these accounts then? But a small business user who just gets Office 365 to help them to be more productive, they're not going to necessarily know about this stuff. And why? Because Microsoft do not document it at all. Now they know about it. They've actually got, when I spoke to them, they've got a flag that should be turned on for the tenant. And basically what happens is that restricts anyone getting into SharePoint at all. So what can you do when you get into SharePoint? You can view everything. You can actually exfiltrate data. You can then edit, create, and remove groups. He can then upgrade his own account to add additional services like Flow or Outlook. And this causes a problem, because what he can then do, he can then send Gary a link or someone else from another department and say, hey, there's a new SharePoint site. And then they'll click onto that, and then he could be um, hosting all sorts of malicious links, everything that he wants. And this is the audit log, and it didn't show anything. In fact, it's not even turned on by standard, so you have to even go through the hassle of that. You can get information gathering by having a look at the search. So you don't even need to touch the sites themselves. You can go through to the search part. And if you go into the classic search, it's really handy because it actually shows you a visual representation of the site itself. So then all you need to do then is clone that site. You can clone that site and then send a link to somebody else to your own site where you're hosting the malicious links. And the admin would not even know. 
So here's an example of data exfiltration. So what I did is I got a, a shared and an unlicensed and I upgraded the, the subscription to add Flow. Now Flow is a way of automation within Microsoft. And what I did is I, I copied every file that was being uploaded from one SharePoint site to another. And this other site, the admin didn't have any idea about, couldn't see it. And the only way that he could do, it wasn't even showing on his frequent sites because he'd never been there. And someone's going to end up getting hacked. I mean, it's not known about. I mean, Microsoft were really good about this whole situation. But and our Microsoft research security team were really good about this situation. The problem is I had is that they um, took the report, um, said it was valid, was going to be added to the Microsoft Hall of Fame, and then it went slowly south. The SharePoint engineering team didn't agree. They said it was a licensing issue and not a security issue. I'm very sorry. I've tried fighting for this. And he did. And my heart goes out to him because his head's probably banging off a desk every day. If this is what's happening with something I found, I don't know what's going on. But I'm sure there's a reason. And that reason was with them, and we can't read it from here, it caused friction with SharePoint adaption. So basically, when they started releasing SharePoint, they had all these licenses, but none of the people were activating the licenses. So they just made it a free-for-all, said, all right, then we'll just turn it on for everyone. And then if they use it, they use it. If they don't, they don't. They allowed everyone, basically, into the tenancy and see the SharePoint. It's known, like I said, but it's not documented. And the way that I can actually do it is by just going on a link. All I need to know, if I'm a hacker, is this link here. And this is the main SharePoint page. So I'm on my admin account right now, and I'm now on a shared, so I'm on a shared sales at victim account. All I need to do is put in the link, and I've got access to the, all the sites there. But there's nothing much on there at the moment because it's just a development one. I've not accessed anything, so I haven't got on the frequent sites. But what our admin, Gary's done, he's a really helpful guy. He's put a list of all the frequent sites for his team members. I can see all this. So there's a team group, and that's private, and the settings are made as private, and that's brilliant. Team group for an organization. Now, bearing in mind, you go and get a Microsoft Office 365 subscription, and you pay for SharePoint for anyone that you want in your organization to see SharePoint. Anyone else, you would assume that they're not going to be able to see any of this stuff. So you make it for the organization. But then the little hacker man here, he can go in. God, this internet. <laughs> and I'll tell you another thing that you can do. You can create a site and you can create a news posts. Do what you want. You can add news. You can add links. You can get to the documents. <coughs> Do everything that you want. It's pretty shit, to be fair. I have not had a look at too much in detail on this sort of stuff. It's specifically around this. <laughs> and if you want to work on something, it'll be good. <laughs> yes. So what can you do about it? So I've had a look at these things, and I, I, I mean, like, I'm no expert, but this is the sort of stuff that I've, I've figured out so far. You can review the SharePoint default configuration settings. You can review the logs and set up alerts specifically for your shared mailboxes and your unlicensed users. You can restrict down and lock down where possible. Now, there are configuration files in the back end of SharePoint where you can do it. You can also ask Microsoft for that flag, and I, I tell you, if you can, and ask them about it, maybe something might actually be done about this. Please delete all unused accounts because they're just sat there waiting to be used by someone else. Activate share shared mailbox monitoring and what will happen is it will actually show up in the audit log. So where I've been messing around there, uh, let's see. Now this isn't turned on by default. Let's see if it's shown in anything. 
nothing. So, shows you. Complain to Microsoft and update the documents because all the documentation don't show it as working. Um, right. Okay, so I've literally not got very much time and I've got more exploits to show you that I found. Um, so this was some secure application I can't name for legal reasons. Reason being, they wanted me to sign in NDA. Um, this was a blind XSS via an embedded widget on the victim's site. So the main thing for me to point out here, a customer would embed a widget on their site. This would then provide a communications channel, say like a comments box or a message us box sort of thing. This would then feed into a platform that the admin of that site would log into. What it was possible to do is just put a load of XSS into there. So as soon as the admin opened up the admin panel on the portal, they would then see this message and get attacked. <sighs> you get hacked, that's what happens. Okay, I remember the little Chloe from earlier on slide. Uh, I sometimes feel like this because I found this issue through due diligence. I do because of my company that I work with. Um, I try and check any apps that we're taking on board and I was like, what? You're actually supposed to be a secure application? Yeah, I could do this and it literally took five minutes to do. I asked them when I um, put through the report to them for a secure channel and they told me to send it through the same means. Um, and it just felt off. So they didn't know about bug bounty programs at all. And then as soon as I talked about uh, maybe a reward, and I was more interested in the library that they were using because it wasn't the reward I wanted to get off them. It was perhaps a third party library that they were using, in which case it would be more valuable for me to know. However, their devs were kind of off. And so were they. So what I did is I created my own NDA and I signed it and I sent it and a detailed report with videos were sub submitted. Now, I've just detailed my points of view on this. No systems were harmed. I will pr produce a report um, and it's done with the mind of the researchers protection and the rights and the confidentiality. Um, I state that I'll keep it co confidential for 90 days after fix. Um, and I was very willing to work with them as much as possible for this to be a positive thing. I then got an email back where they basically um, said, um, yep, sure, no problem, they've signed it, but then their CEO is actually detailed here, the nature of any such agreement will be at the sole discretion of the platform as it deems appropriate to the impact of the findings on its key business objectives. I found XSS in multiple places of their system and they're a secure site. I would have thought that that would have impacted their business models significantly. So they patched it, arranged a future pen test and further support is all done. Uh, they assist it as not severe. Basically, these developers that I kind of felt a bit off about previously um, have turned around and said, oh, no, 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 that wasn't an issue at all. It wasn't a problem and downplayed it. So even if you're speaking to a company, maybe the developers are working with might have other ideas. Um, and what can you do in that sort of situation? The CEO asked for the extent of the vulnerability. So I did another report and another video. And I said to him, look, this is serious. This is an XSS. You know, I can do this. Um, showed them different attacks. And as part of this, the developers have actually said that they had measures in the background that would prevent this. <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> I did it. So this was going over a long period of time. Then I got an offer of £75. This is a company that's actually had um, investment funding for the security of the platform. And, and I'm not money driven at all, I couldn't care, but what frustrated me was the fact that the developers or the client, because of the developers were perhaps saying something different, would just not get in the severity of everything. What else did they try to do? They tried to say, yeah, we'll give you £75 and you can have a free subscription for three months on our program, but we want you to sign up to 12 months with our system. Um, and also their NDA was indefinite, meaning I could not talk about it ever, which I felt was unfair. I said 90 days, so 
basically they gave me 10 days to reply and I was too busy doing other stuff so I didn't bother. Sometimes you just need to know it's worth drawing a line and walking away because they're not going to listen. So the good. So the BlueInt file upload vulnerability, I don't know if any of you guys have heard about it before. Basically, it's one of the largest GitHub repos out there um, with like 8,000 forks and 30,000 stars. I didn't find it, but my friend Larry did. I reached out to Larry, said I was really interested in this. Could I have a look at things? And he was brilliant. Um, I spent a whole weekend working with him, writing one of my first official reports, and it felt brilliant having that kind of support. And I think that's one of the things as security researchers, you grow that little community around you to help you, and it helps massively. Um, so the problem with this was you had the ability to upload any file type due to the lack of checks. You had the ability to upload to the server's root due to a misconfiguration issue. You also had a problem where the developer had put in security mechanisms, but because Apache had updated its own configuration files, it then superseded the protections that the developer put in place. So that was another area of problems. So the good things of it. I found that a platform had in been using the uh, file upload library, and then they were then passing distributing their own platform. Um, it's quite popular. So they actually re responded to things and managed to get it resolved within 48 hours. It was patched within their own platform. It was brilliant. Um, and they were really good about it. Also, the developer of BlueImp was really good. He's actually written some security documentation, how to configure everything properly. Um, and that was a really positive experience. Um, the report that I wrote, Larry then distributed to the Akamai security research, research team and his managers. And then he also gave me a shout out on the Akamai blog. Um, <laughs> and let me just go back to that one. And I guess from this one here, the point is, um, when I did this, I, I looked into it and I wanted to send out vulnerability reports uh, to other people who might be using this because there are 20,000 other sites that could possibly be affected by this. And even though when I did it, no one got back to me, I still feel that it was a good end to something I was working on because of the support, because I've worked with different people, including um, CDNJS. So they host all the JavaScript to make it quicker for web developers. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to cut the head off the snake and possibly use a redirection technique where anyone who was using the old versions of the BlueImp um, library would then be forwarded to the new. And we had a discussion. Now, obviously, with that, you could actually probably brick sites. Uh, so we didn't go ahead with it. But it was still a very positive discussion and something where researchers should look into in the future. So an unnamed C call for paper platform. This is something that's going on at the moment. Um, it allowed for other people to see data about another person by entering their email address. Um, so that was the information disclosure. You also had XSS. Um, and you could attack anyone because of the way that the data was being passed through the system. You could actually attack the reviewing committee. Now, bearing in mind, some of these people who are on the reviewing committees for call for papers are very important people. These were people within our own industry. This was a platform within information security. So why was it happening? People didn't know. The, the developers in the platform had a feature enabled, and they didn't know about it. But as soon as they did, they turned it off. They said it was a feature and not a bug. And I can't go into too much details because it's still been waiting to be cleared by legal. Um, but they were fantastic. They acted on reports immediately. I was up till 4 o'clock in the morning writing the reports, and then the next morning sent it through. And over the weekend period, they'd fixed everything, which was fantastic. And there was communication. There was communication backwards and forwards between me and them. And I think that speaks for itself. When you have that level of communication, it really does help. I didn't go onto Twitter and drop this and be like, oh, there's all this bad stuff going on in information security, and look, look what they're doing, you know? They're supposed to be the security professionals. I didn't do that. I, I, I worked through, and it's because you have to make the right choice when doing this, but I think also during the process, 
what happens impacts on what you do. Um, so really grateful and we're going through uh, a range of rewards, but to be fair, I'm not too fussed about that. It's just the fact that my fellow information security peers are going to be okay, that um, I'm happy. And I literally, I felt like that. <laughs> so, awesome people. Shout out to my man, Zeph. <laughs> None of this, what I've done, <laughs> ever, ever see. Um, <laughs> always helps. Name dropper. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been my first year and I hope that you might have learned a bit from some of the things that I've discovered and I didn't know what I was doing and hopefully that during this talk I might have made some points about things that you can take away with you. Um, but one of the people that I did reach out to was Zephyr Fish and he gave me a bug bounty template that I use now, even still. And it really helped me because it put everything that I needed to put down and give to a vendor in a really nice way. So have a look at his GitHub. Also, some shout outs to some other amazing people. Like, you need support from the community when you're going through this, even if it's just like <laughs> you need an agony aunt at the other end of a, a voice call. Um, so the Many Hats Club, uh, they have a really good research community and they're fantastic. And when you're pulling your hair out, you can speak to other researchers about it and it really does help. You have Cybersex Stu, he's been a great person to speak to also. Ghosty, who, who looked at some of the stuff that I've, I've done uh, with regards to this presentation and reviewed parts of it. And obviously Zef. He's also got a book, by the way, if you didn't know. <laughs> Buy the book. And we can. So I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to give back a little myself. Um, what I've done is I've provided a template of the Blueimp file upload report, which actually does go down into detail. Um, I was running out of time, so I've had to bash straight through it. Um, but what you can do, you can go onto my website, you can uh, go to the Google link there, get the report, and you can start sending these vulnerability reports out to other web websites that are out there. Uh, there's a lot of companies, smaller companies especially, that are vulnerable and they need our help to do it. Um, so I've given you all the tools that you need to get started. All I ask you, let us know how you get on. Um, and I think we could actually probably make a little difference doing that. So if you're new to all this and you want to get started, have a look at that because everything's there for you. Further help. So know your rights, know your terms um, of service when you're working on a product, the software, understand the ISOs, know the laws in which you need to abide by and have a look at the end user license agreements. Get a decent template together, I have one now thankfully, and work on explaining frequent problems with diagrams and videos to help. Then you won't get the to and fro, we don't understand the problem, so can you expand? So what I found was analogies and examples really do work. I also um, have a AWS server that I've set up to demonstrate proof of concepts. And what I've done with my XSS reports is I've done a redirection attack. And then that redirection attack then leads to a page where you have a keylogger that's embedded into the site. So it's a very nice visual representation for that person they see somebody else's credentials being stolen because you've cloned their site, they're putting the details in and they can see that it's actually um, been stolen live. Um, form friendships and get the researcher community behind you and seek advice because you never know when you might need it. Take a break and get a clear head whenever you can and mainly don't be a dick as well. <laughs> um, and Uber has actually got a little Santa's list and what he does, now Uber's um, one of my friends and he's actually got this list. He's the guy who had the problem with Atrium. He's the guy who got hit. Now he's now got a website um, and he's got a Santa's naughty list. All nice list and he lists down all the people that he's working with and what the status is with those people and if they've been idiots or not. So that, you know, I'm not saying you should do it, but yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, so final thoughts. We do not live in an ideal world. Um, go and have a look at the guide. Really nice closing part that he's got with the conclusion. And I don't think we even got time for questions, have we? No, no. Thank you.